Hi everyone, Sleepy Soul here, uh, and back with another video. In today's video, we're going to talk about one sector that has been uh, beaten down uh, because one of its uh, components have been uh, ripping up as if it was NVIDIA, and that is uh, convectures, or alternatively known as chocolate-based products. Uh, so, uh, as usual, if you guys like these videos, click the like and subscribe button down below. Um, so this is... Uh, cocoa futures. Now, cocoa is obviously a major component of chocolate. We're going to talk about four names uh, today. Uh, but but if you went long cocoa in the bottom of October 2022, which is right here, and sold at the top this past week, uh, I think it was. I think the, technically, the, I think the spike was actually on Thursday. You would have made more than if you went long Bitcoin at the lows. Not as much as you would have made if you were to NVIDIA at the lows, but pretty damn close. But for a futures contract, this is nuts to see three times move. And really, I mean, really, since January of this year, it's almost doubled. So it's been on a straight line up. Now, obviously, input costs don't flow directly into the end, you, end product right away. There's a lot of hedging. Um, you know, if you if you are in the chocolate business, you likely own your contracts, not just this month, but, you know, next month, month after month, after that month, after that month, after that, because you want some stability in your product because you need to know what prices are going to be. But still, what happens when you see these moves like this is it pulls the whole curve, which might have been down here, all the way to up here. Uh, it doesn't, it, it very rarely goes like this. Now, this, these candles right here, this is the weekly, by the way, these last two candles are, are a sign that we're getting close to exhaustion. In fact, if we pull the daily up here, uh, again, it's not super clean. I don't really like using dailies on the, on the contracts, but you can kind of see it's, it's starting to pull back a little bit. Okay. So let's go back to the weekly. Uh, you know, it finished, it finished at, uh, 6394, uh, which was higher than, than last week's low. So it is making a, a higher low, but the assumption is if, if momentum's rolling over and the, this beta rolls over, it, it likely will come down. And if it comes down aggressively, uh, the companies that are, have been put under pressure because the assumption is input costs are going up should see, uh, some, uh, uh, some relief. Now, the most obvious one is a company I will never buy, and that's mostly because uh, the foreign ex the, the ADR is is uh, very thinly traded, and the foreign exchange fees are too expensive. So this is uh, Barnard uh, Calibant, I think is how you pronounce it. It's a Swiss-based company. They're the largest confectioner uh, manufacturer in the world, as in they make chocolate from cocoa. Uh, this thing, if you in if you add in uh, cocoa futures, uh, oops. We adding cocoa futures to this chart. It's it's a pretty inverse relationship, right? Uh, you know, cocoa goes down, uh, Barnard goes up, uh, uh, Barry Carlebot goes up. As cocoa futures start ripping, this goes down. So if you are able to buy Swiss companies inexpensively, my brokerage, which is Schwab, charges $100 uh, plus basically a 1% trade fee. Uh, so it's not really worth it on a position unless I want to uh, if I want to kind of low uh, move into this position, but given it's a leverage play on cocoa, I'm not, I, I wouldn't just go, I'm going to build a whole position in one day. And uh, the ADR is just too thinly traded. So I won't be touching this name, unfortunately. Uh, but, but again, as you can see, it, it really is just like an inverse relationship. The, the, the further out you look, the further back you look, the more and more it, it becomes obvious that every time cocoa goes down, uh, it, uh, the stock price goes up. So the stock has been under a lot of pressure because cocoa products have gone up. Um, that being said, there are three names that you can, uh, I'm not doing much research beyond that, obviously, or much commentary beyond that. Uh, what is it? Mondelez, uh, oh, that's Mond uh, Mondelez International, there it is. Um, Mondelez makes about 18% of their income from convectature-based products, if I'm not mistaken. It's a... Uh, it's a smaller player in the candy market. The the largest player that is not publicly traded is uh, the largest players are Hershey, Mondelez, Mars, and uh, Nestle. And you can't buy Mars. It's privately held by the by the Mars family, uh, which I think they're based in both Pennsylvania and Chicago. Uh, old. Um, and then, then Hershey's obviously publicly traded under HSY. Uh, Mondelez is what we're looking at right now, and then we'll talk about Nestle in a second. But uh, Mondelez has been under a less pressure because, again, they they have a uh, again comparatively to Cocoa because they have less direct exposure uh, 
to Coco than uh, some of the other companies. Like I, again, Mars is not publicly traded, but if you were to look at, I'm guessing the Mars uh, income the operating margins would be under some level of pressure or the anticipated operating margins would be under some level of pressure. And then the, uh, the tradable value of their equity would go down because again, M and M's is a large portion of their business. Mars bars, is a large portion of the business, Snickers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, this is kind of a, this is a consumer staple. That's just done. Okay. You see that, right. It's just kind of grinded higher. If we adjust it for, we adjust it for dividends, it's grinded even a little more aggressively higher, but, it too has been under some pressure for Coco. This is another name I probably wouldn't touch uh, specifically for this Coco play. Um, this is a, the amount of lease is a fine, uh, fine, fine, fine uh, uh, consumer staple. I, I would probably look at Procter and Gamble, PepsiCo, and General Mills instead of Mondelez uh, International uh, before. Uh, uh, unless I wanted candy exposure, but if I wanted candy exposure, I would look at Nestle. But we're going to talk about Nestle last. First, we're going to talk about Hershey. So Hershey. Ignore the blue lines. I'll get to in a second. Similar chart to Barry, uh, Barry Armor, uh, Carbonant. Uh, I'm going to get that name right eventually. Uh, Carbonara. Um, popped when cocoa was cheap in the beginning of uh, beginning of 2023 in May, and it's basically been on a direct line down, and it's found some support uh, recently. Uh, we'll show we'll show some support lines in a second once we get to the daily chart. Uh, but but again, under pressure now. Hershey has. Let's get rid of this cocoa here. Um, Hershey has found uh, Hershey has started to find a base um, over the last last six weeks, really, or really since the October low. It's been trading kind of flat. October low, it closed the week of October 9th at uh, 197 or 190.75. It closed this week at 194.20. Uh, so you know we're up de minimis percentage while the market's up 25%. That's not to be completely unexpected given that Hershey is, uh, you know, a consumer staple. It's viewed as more defensively. And I'll turn, and also, oh, I think this one's the Hershey one. You know, the, their, their full year guide outlook for 2024, which came out two week, uh, three weeks ago, net sales are only expected to grow at about 2 to 3%, okay? So, you know, it's not like we're, we're, we're buying something that's massively growing here. Now, the advantage is they have this uh, derivative. Uh, where is it? Uh, bear with me one second. Uh, they have this derivative uh, trading division, which last quarter made uh, uh, fifty three dollars or fifty three billion a million dollars um, or alternatively twenty six cents a share if their derivative division is just as quality as it was in q q1 as it is was in q4 when cocoa was ripping higher it's highly likely that this two to three percent um, net sales growth will probably bot uh, increase EPS or you'll probably see uh, EPS increase uh, where is the EPS number uh, by an extra you know fifty to uh, um, 65 cents over the course of the year just from the derivative trading. Uh, so again, we're looking at maybe, you know, they're, they're estimating nine, flat EPS growth of $9 and 60, just under $9 and 60 cents a share. But if their derivative trading is as solid as it has been in the past and, and Hershey's derivative trading has been very solid, you're probably looking at a company that's going to do $10 and 25 cents to $10 and 50 cents in uh, $10 and sorry, $10 and 15 cents to $10 and 35 cents in earnings. That puts you at approximately, again, it's not really that hard. 194 divided by just over $10. We're at 19 times earnings. Uh, this year's earnings. Now next year, next year in 2025, earnings are expected to grow a little bit faster. And the anticipation reason why is because again, cocoa prices and input costs are coming down, and more importantly, inventory levels are finally, finally, finally clearing the channels. So that'll cause uh, that, that'll cause more buying on the wholesale level and more. Uh, 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 higher EPS growth for Hershey's the company. So Hershey's is kind of interesting uh, from the cocoa perspective. Now from the stock perspective, uh, or as, as cocoa exposure again because of their derivatives trading division. Now from the from the technical point of view, if you guys look here on the bottom, with the exception of uh, you know really uh, the beginning middle of January, this one time when it 
peaked all the way to $210 and then immediately sold off. With the exception of that, this week's volume was the highest has, has been since the bottom of COVID. So the, the stock is clearly, clearly, clearly trying to put in a bottom. Okay. It's got, a, I think, a 4% dividend yield or 3.5% dividend yield, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, sorry, 2.8%. I was way off on that. I apologize. But th this big dotted uh, dashed line is the... Um, uh, the 2021 high, uh, it, it hit there four times before finally breaking through. So there is a little, you can call it a little support there. Uh, you know, it's, and again, if it puts in a bottom here, that support, it goes from light support to heavy support, uh, where there is a little more support, excuse me, that's not supposed to be there. Uh, where there is a little more heavy support is all the way down here at the $150, the 150 point level that they traded it up and down in there. Now it double did double top in 2019, uh, at the 160, 60 level. So, you know, one thing you can, you can look at is if you want to get long Hershey's and you're kind of, you're kind of like, Hey, I'd rather get long next year when earnings growth starts to stay is you, you, you can do, uh, you can sell puts at this hundred and, you know, let's call it 170 level that gets you, uh, you know, for 2025 and then buy calls to the upside. So I pulled here the January, 2025, uh, uh, options as of close of Friday on the eighth, uh, Hershey out of the money puts, you can see here that the, the large volume is really at the 170, 175 number. You're getting about, let's call it $8, uh, 750 and, um, and, and about 630. So if you buy the, if you, if you sell the 170s, you're buying it at 163, uh, and change. If you sell the 175s, you're buying it at 167 and change. And that gets you again to this dashed line, uh, where the double top was, you know, 162, 163. So you're buying, you know, with, with the premium, you're buying it pretty damn close. If you sell the one seventies at the, uh, 2029 high. Okay. So that's, that's, that's an okay place to go long there. Uh, if you think that's going to make support and then you can sell if you wanted to upside call or buy, excuse me, not sell upside calls. And at the $6 range, you can get somewhere between the two twenties and two thirties, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the range you can get in there. And that gets you, you know, back into the, let, let's call it like this range of, of chop, which is, you know, pretty clear where the, where the top end support was before the, with, with the, with this being the blow off. Right. Um, so that's, that's kind of an interesting setup. Again, that's the 20, that's the January, 2025 numbers. So you're basically saying, Hey, I'll buy this on the uptrend here. Uh, so this line uh, on the uptrend here is, is we're on the weekly here, right? So uh, this has been the uptrend since uh, the 2010 uh, lows. You can really see like, right, we, we, we briefly broke below it in 2016, immediately got bought, spent about a year below it in 2018 with the broader market in early 2019. And then the COVID bottom kind of kept putting it support, but it's, it's pretty much been, that's the uptrend to buy on. So if you go out to January, of 2025, right? So where is January of 25? So January of 25 is here. Okay. And then we go down, 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 down. So January of 25, the uptrend is about 165. Again, my line's not exactly to the penny perfect. Uh, so, so the whole, don't, don't be like, Oh, you said it's 164.76. Like, no, it's just, just call it roughly 170, 165. So again, you sell the, going back to the options op, uh, number, you sell the, uh, you sell the 175s for just under eight dollars. You're getting them for 168. Well, 168 is is what four points higher uh th than than the uptrend. That's not a terrible place to go long uh, if you wanted to go long Hershey. And again, you can get the free trade to the upside if you wanted to do it there. So this gives you a lot of exposure to if you think Coco is going to come down, because again, the assumption would be if Coco comes down, the market will start pricing in more operations margins, which means EPS will go up. If EPS goes up, that means that, you know, at 16, 17, 18 times earnings, you know, you could start seeing some growth there. Uh, his, the, the, the analysts are, are more constructive on Hershey uh, two to three years out than I think the market is right now, the sell side analyst that is. Uh, the numbers for uh, 20, uh, 26 are almost $11 and 2027 is $10.80. So it's anticipating some substantial growth in 26 and 27 uh, or 25. Again, it's, it's uh, expected to be 10, 10, um, uh, 24, excuse me, is expected to be just, uh, just above, uh, where the market, uh, where the, where the, um, where Hershey is at 
yes, yeah, nine dollars and sixty eight cents. Uh, the high though is ten dollars and twenty five cents. So, you know that that's kind of where the where the market is pricing it. It's 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 going to be a slow twenty twenty four and then kind of a spike in twenty twenty five. And this is earnings. Uh, I don't know. If it looks like the share price, but the share price should follow the earnings. So, uh, so that might be why it's start it's starting to put in the bottom is as as we get start getting into twenty twenty four. We start putting in, uh, you know, we start comps start getting easier. Twenty twenty. So for 2025, again, this uptrend gets closer and closer and then it kind of skyrockets. OK, so Hershey's pretty interesting here again, because it's an American equity. You can't play the stock market. You can't play it on, on uh, options. So, you know, it makes it a little bit more interesting from that perspective. Maybe it's something where if you if it ever breaks below this 181 mark uh, and looks like it's going to get bought out, that's when you sell your 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 underpriced options. But again, Coco, uh, I'm going to pull up Coco futures real quick before we go to Nestle. Uh, Coco is very similar to, excuse me, I apologize, guys. I'm still dealing with my cold. Uh, Coco has very, been like putting in kind of similar charts to Bitcoin and NVIDIA and, and the momentum stocks in general. Uh, you know, if you, we add, what is it, MTUM uh, is momentum. You know, you put in momentum factor and just since, the beginning of year, uh, year to date, you know, again, momentum started to slow down now recently and, and Coco started to roll over. So, uh, again, what's another good example. Let's put in NVIDIA again, similar ish thing. MTUM is, is the momentum index for MSI. Um, What's like CRM has been high on momentum, AMD, you know, you can kind of see, right? So if you think AMD is rolling over, Coco is likely to roll over. You think NVIDIA is rolling over. For some reason, Coco has gotten caught up in this, this, this momentum trade. And it's been very strange because uh, this is just like, it's not the commodities in general. It's just Coco. And, you know, again, so, so if you think momentum is rolling over and Hershey's probably an interesting stock, the last stock we're going to talk about is uh, Nestle. So Nestle. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, is the largest by by amount of sales uh, volume um, uh, is the largest by sales uh, volume in terms of uh, consumer staples, it's largest in the world, and it's not even close. Now, the problem with uh, uh, the problem with uh, um, Nestle is they are traded in um, uh, Swiss francs. That's their Based denomination currency. Now, the problem with that is the Swiss franc currency is the strongest currency in the world right now, and that's probably not going to change near term. So, Nestle does a lot of business in sub-Saharan Africa. They do a lot of business in Southeast Asia. They do a lot of business in South America. They do a lot of business in North America. They do a lot of business in Europe. But all those currencies are weaker, and all their all of their input costs are based in uh, Swiss franc. And all of their export or all their income is based really not in Swiss franc. Ergo, uh, their operating margins have looked terrible. And, we'll, and we can see that here. So gross margins, you know, have come down. Now they're, they're expected to be flat uh, going forward. This is Nestle's... Um, full year 2023 so we'll look through this real quick so one thing that's bullish on you can make an argument bullish on nestle because again nestle's not just convectatures uh though convectatures is uh the largest growing segment outside of pet care uh and we'll show that in a second but uh food inflation in general is coming down that means input costs are coming down which means the margins are going to go up but yeah see rig is the number you want to focus on with nestle that's basically real internal growth is 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 how much they're selling, right? So Nestle Professional is some of their uh, white label stuff. Uh, HMO products is a growing segment, but really their real growth is is really, you know, not just KitKat, but it's their Convectature's brand. Um, and then see, again, they talk about delivering RIG-led growth. They have to use RIG because they're, they're, they make income all over the world. There's the problem. One of the problems with Nestle is there's not a lot of growth left because they're in every geo area. So unless they can create a new food breakthrough, which everyone thought, uh, you know, beyond meat and, and vegan led options, were going to be another great food breakthrough that was going to power Nestle to another three, uh, eight to 10% growth. Um, the, uh, in terms of their organic sales, uh, <laughs> 
uh, you know, they don't unless they see something like that or they buy something. Their organic sales growth are always going to be around uh, three to five percent, and that there's nothing wrong with that because they they squeeze margins so much that their uh, EPS growth via, via just organic sales buybacks and and and, and then operation margin management uh, always ends up to be high single digits. So you're getting a solid return here. I want to be very clear here. You're getting a solid return from Nestle. What you're never going to find with Nestle is the just raw power of a stock that like, you know, buying Facebook or Google or Microsoft was last year. You're just not going to see that. What you are going to see is a company that if you buy it today and you leave it alone for 15 years, one, you don't have to worry about it going out of business, which is, you know, the longer you're in the market, the more you realize that's actually a risk you need to care about. And two, it's a stock that will appreciate, you know, slightly above GDP returns, and you're going to get a dividend while you do that. Now, so again, the, the 2024 five outlook is better than the 2024 outlook. Mid single digits organic growth. Uh, again, similar line, so slightly higher than the 4%. Uh, trading operating margins of uh, low uh, low or high double digits. And then consistent under uh, underlying sales sales growth. Remember, they buy back about one and a half to two percent of shares a year. So this plus your uh, organic sales growth gets you to about six percent, and the ten percent is the upside. Okay, uh, and you can see this with uh, free cash flow. So again, seven point eight. Uh, sorry, full year sales like seven point eight. Uh, percent of their sales or was ripped off because of foreign exchange, right? Because their currency is so strong comparatively to literally every currency, including the dollar. So again, you know, they started with, uh, you know, they had nine, uh, seven point two organic uh, sales growth. You know, some of that was, uh, though this uh, rig being negative was bad, uh, but it only it pulled out a negative number because uh, comparatively because the uh, uh, because of the foreign exchange. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, we're not going to cover too too much, but they, again, they expect RIG to go back to a rig to go back to positive. That's bullish, uh, considering it's been negative since the mid 2026. But what they or it's not 2026, 2022. What they did was they stuffed the channels when inflation started going higher. So you know they talked about this uh, that when they had low. Um, low cost items, they overstuffed the channels in 2022 and that caused uh, low internal growth and a uh, real low real growth. And that's now starting to reverse and they're going to start seeing positive in 20, uh, 2024 and 2025. Now there were some other charts here. I wanted to show you guys, uh, Again, margins are coming back. That was the chart I led on. Uh, you know, advertising and marketing expected to go higher, but that that'll that, they're not anticipating a, a hit to margins, which means that they're expected to see more demand once they start advertising again. And then again, EPS is expected in constant currency to go up pretty nicely. It's the FX impact that got that hit it. And again, free cash flow, same thing. <laughs> Uh, as a, I don't at a share price to free cash flow, it hasn't been any higher uh, uh, in a while. It hasn't been this high in a while. It's I think it's 2019 is the last time uh, free cash flow yield has been this high on, on Nestle. Um, and again, you're seeing that cash flow from generate uh, generations almost 20 percent, and their free cash flow targets 12 percent uh, uh, as a as a percentage of sales. So they're growing. And then again, this was the inventory levels. If we could get back to 10 percent inventory levels, Nestle will be a screaming, screaming, screaming buy. Um, and then again, return on invested capital is is turning higher. Everything again, Nestle's basically in a, been in a period of consolidation for their earnings power uh, because you know again they had currency issues, they had inventory channel issues, uh, they had inflation issues, and all that stuff is starting to come out. So and then the net debt is basically stable, and there's nothing wrong there. Now, the only other interesting slide was on this PowerPoint. Uh, do, 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 do. Then we saw that already. Do we, do we already get it? Um, you know, again, free cash flows is anticipated to go up to historic levels. And then the dividend has gone up, is tripled uh, uh, over the last 18 years, right? Um, and then uh, the proposed dividend is likely to be, I think it's $4. Uh, what is, oh, let me see what the currency is right now. So so it's 13, 14 cents. So it's it's going to be $3.45 is, is going to be the U.S. Um, uh, roughly U.S. proposed dividend for 2023. They do a one-time-a-year dividend because it's a European company. So Nestle, Nestle has been in this massive uptrend. Uh, if you adjust for this, for the for the um, 
dividend uh, because again they only pay once a year so it's not it's not as complicated as uh, American where they take the dividend and split it by four it's just here's your, you, they go X dividend I think in April uh, so here's the dividend uh, no, no questions asked um, so they've been on this pretty nice uptrend again they broke very below below at very similar times to Hershey in 2016 and very briefly in 2018 though they didn't stay as low and then it broke out of this uptrend going into COVID in 2018 and that's when if you go back to uh, the free cash flow 2018 had, you know, uh, obscene growth and obscene growth in 2019 and free cash flow. And then that came down. So the assumption was that free cash flow was going to continue growing. Now, in 2018, we did uh, at, uh, in 2019, it did provide this nice high at about $105, at which point it also hit that high in June of 25 uh, or 2020. Uh, it based there in 20 uh, in November 20, uh, and then it, it kind of found support there in in June of 22, uh, October of 22, and now it's finding support there right around now. So this 105-ish mark again. Don't use my lines to to, to be specific. Uh, this 105-ish mark is been the kind of battleground really for the last uh, four years, and it is going on four years. Uh, but again, you, you think about it. Nestle is is the largest, as I mentioned, largest uh, uh, consumer staple in in the in the world. 20% of their business is convectures. They've been hit on that a little bit, but they've had other inventory problems. But broadly, you can use Nestle is is not so much exposed directly to uh, just cocoa costs. They're exposed to all commodity costs. And if the assumption is you think commodities are getting weaker uh, or in food inflation is going down, which Nestle thinks that, uh, you can make an argument that $105 here is relatively inexpensive at 19 times next year's or, or this year's earnings. Uh, and then probably about 18 times next year, you know, again, 10% growth or, or 5% organic growth. And then you get your stock dividend, uh, not dividend, uh, stock buyback. So we're in the midpoint of the channel of this uptrend. It gets kind of, we're actually, we're at the kind of more interesting support line where we've, where we had some battles volume is picked up and you see that down here. Uh, oops. You see that down here. Why is my thing so low scroll slow you see that down here and again that's the largest volume since since covid and then since o the october lows so you can kind of look at where the price was right so covid was down here but the october lows uh was also at 105 so you know you can make an, uh, and then again even when you want to look at these higher levels here and here we're also at 105 and we're at one we're below 105 so you know you can look at that and say hey uh there's this is this is a nice shelf of support uh, if cocoa turns up or turns down in price, the, the assumption is the KitKat input prices will go lower, uh, uh, which means KitKat margins will go up, which will improve uh, uh, Nestle's margins. Ergo, the stock should go higher. Now, it has been in this downtrend that I think pretty much all consumer staples have been since January of 2022, except for like Procter & Gamble. And, uh, you know, that intersects with the uptrend sometime mid next year. Nestle doesn't really have options because it's an ADR. So you can't do that there. Uh, you can't really look at it there. But again, this is a nice stock to put in your long-term account with about a 3% dividend yield. They do raise the dividend pretty much every year. Uh, you get, you're not getting aggressive growth, right? I want to be very clear with Nestle. You don't buy this because you're like, wow, it's going to grow 20% this year and no one's pricing that in. You get it because, hey, it's growing 5% this year and everyone's just forgetting about it. And then next year it's going to grow 5% on that. And then next year it's going to go grow 5% on that. They buy back shares to get the share float down a little bit every year. Again, you're not, it's not a seen amount. It's like 1%, uh, but it does add a little bit uh, to, to the EPS accretion. And again, you know, over time, this just grinds higher, right? And you see that even before COVID or before 2020, we can take this back to uh, 95 and it, it has been a publicly traded company. I think longer than that, just the ADR was in 90 came in in 95, you know, it's 20 X since then. Uh, so, and you've gotten paid, I, th I think four, uh, three times over on your dividend yield. Uh, so, you know, it's an attractive company to own long time. Uh, again, you're not, you don't buy this and say, Hey, I'm going to run to the newspaper or check every morning to see how it's doing. But again, it, it, it tends to grind higher historically. It's been in this nice trading range for the last four years. But again, you see that really, if you bought in May of, of 14, right? So let's, let's just put a line here. If you bought in May of 2014, you were flat till June, July of 18. So in four years, you were basically up like 2%. 
and then it just took off. So, you know, again, you, you buy it here uh, in 2019, it's now 2024, so about uh, five years versus four, it, it did nothing. And now, you know, it's probably going to start, now that they fixed some of the inventory issues, they fixed the margin problems, maybe the maybe the Swiss franc gets a little bit, uh, uh, lose, lose, lo uses, loses a little bit of strength as the Europe uh, European Union pulls themselves out of a recession and China looks a little bit more constructive. Uh, and Japan looks, the J Japanese yen looks a little bit more enticing with uh, them ending yield curve control. Again, you can make an argument that this might see you know, eight to 10 uh, points uh, or eight to 10 percent total return over the next five years as a CAGR, right? Like, so you're going to get a three percent dividend annually and then five percent of a share price. So, you know, again, you're, you're, you don't buy this to, to expect it to rip higher, but it wouldn't surprise me if it does. Uh, and it, now that we're in the midpoint of the channel, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we see we finish the year around 120 ish dollars with a three, per, which if you buy it now, you get that three percent dividend. That's a total return of about 15 percent between now and let's call it this time next year. That's not the end of the world. Uh, that's probably that might outperform the S&P 500. So anyways, um, I, I, you this one Nestle isn't really a convectature play. It's really a uh, play. Uh, because it's been weak, because all the people think it's a play, uh, a play in that space. Hershey's obviously the chocolate play. I think it's pretty interesting here at the current at current uh, prices. Uh, I, I wouldn't touch Mondelez just because uh, I, I don't really follow it that well, and I rather buy you know Nestle and then Barry Carbonara uh, uh, or, or Carbonara uh, carbonated water uh, is is probably the the stock you want to buy if you can if you have cheap trade trade fees into the Swiss market and you want just raw leverage to cocoa. Cause if cocoa's rolling over, this stock will double. Okay. Uh, this is your, your raw leverage is this stock will double if, if, if cocoa rolls over anyways, uh, I know this is not a sector, uh, we normally talk about, but consumer staples tends to be kind of boring, but I think there's pretty some, okay. Uh, some interesting returns here, but I hope you guys all like this video, click the like and subscribe button down below, and we will talk to you all soon. Peace.